Hey, horror fans, once again, it's the Horror Mives of Money GN. Yes, this time we're going to do a spoiler review for the first time on my channel. We're going to do a spoiler review for Halloween 2018. Yes. <laughs> now, just to give you a fair warning, this is the spoiler review for Halloween 2018. If you have not seen the movie but want to know what I thought about that, uh, stop this video right now. I'll probably put a card somewhere up here. Click on that card right there, watch my non-spoiler review, and then after you watch that, watch that, or watch the movie, and either which order, then you come and watch this movie. And watch this video, I should say. <laughs> All right, let's go. You've been warned. I'm going to spoil everything what happened in Halloween 8 2018. Now, I'm going to break this down into sections here. Uh, let's first, let's talk about the film itself. Uh, I'm going to break down the film. Obviously, the film looks great. It was filmed beautifully. I have to give uh, David uh, Gordon Greer and his uh, team and his filmmaker team, they really did a good job here. Uh, the film has, it looks great. Uh, first of all, the opening scene, which you probably see in the trailers about Michael and the uh, how he's standing there. And we have the two British journalists interviewing him. That looks nice. Uh, I'm pretty sure that um, that's what they do for um, mental patients and facilities to get their exercises. They'll have them standing on blocks and this nice open space so they can get their exercise. So that scene was pretty good. I like that opening scene right there. Now, obviously, uh, I, I like uh, the fact when they shoot to Laurie Strom's house in the second part of the story. Because the film opens up, we get first what's Michael doing, and then we get what's Laurie doing. So I thought it was nice contrast between the two. Both are in isolation uh, situations. Laurie Shaw has isolated herself, and she's also armed her entire uh, walkway. I mean, when the uh, reporters come to visit her, they eventually have to ring a doorbell. And uh, not a doorbell, a uh, gate key, and they have to key it in, and she actually has monitors set up every which way. Uh, I like the fact that the um, ladies journalist offered her $3,000 for them to see to see her. And uh, I thought it was pretty interesting how they're both isolated. They don't they don't say anything to each other one. Uh, it's a different contrast to see how even though there are antagonists and protagonists, both of them also have lived somewhat similar lives. The rest of the film, of course, is, as we go on further into the film, you have the atmosphere. Everything brings back uh, memories of the first film, uh, especially after Michael escapes. Uh, and Because uh, it does take some time for the, uh, the film to set up, but that's only because we're setting up the characters in the story. But once Michael escapes and he puts on that iconic mask, that's when we get hearts back to everything that the first film was. Now, it's a lot different than what Rob Zombie did in his movie. Now, I like I said before, the problem with Rob Zombie's film was that, uh, which I don't like the remakes, after Michael gets grown and he gets his mask on, it's just a carbon copy of what happened in the first film. But this film doesn't do a carbon copy. Yeah, it's similar in its ways, but it's not a carbon copy. It just pays homage to the original, but it's done in a different style, in a different way. But that same atmosphere, the same tension, the same build is what makes this movie much more, much better than what Rob Zombie did in his film. No, of course, <laughs> I think one of the scenes that I like in the picture is when uh, Michael Myers meets up with the uh, journalist after they leave Stray Holmes and he's escaped and it's the 31st. I thought it was pretty interesting how they're talking in the background. They wanted to have Michael and Lori meet for the first time, which I thought was a kind of a nice way to try to see they can get Lori to look past Michael, which I thought was pretty interesting. Some people might think that was stupid, even though we knew that would never happen. Yeah, like I was saying, you wouldn't think that would happen, but I thought it was an interesting way to try to get those two together. <laughs> All right, let's go with the story. Now, as I mentioned before, I thought the story was pretty, it's a simple story. Uh, something that we've seen in other horror movies together, we have the sequel. Uh, I like Lori's background story as far as what she's been doing since the night. Uh, she's not had a very nice life. Uh, she suffers from PSD. She's had two failed marriages. She does has a, she's a, a semi-estranged from her daughter. While she does try to maintain a somewhat relationship with her granddaughter, but you can tell that she's still 
uh, affected by what happened to the events. And uh, how she deals with it is that she decided to isolate herself. Um, like I said before, you know, she's got all the securities, locks on the doors, uh, uh, TV camera set up all over the world. She's got guns, magazines. She's got guns and rifles. I mean, everything is set up. She even trained her daughter <laughs> to, to be on the lookout for Michael because that's her daughter, uh, what her life was like. Daughter's name is Karen. Uh, she's the typical uh, daughter in this film. Uh, she's just simply just trying to lead her life and lead her grand, uh, lead her grand, uh, her daughter's life, and, and try to get past what's happening. Now, the daughter, uh, her daughter, uh, Allison, uh, she's trying to maintain a relationship with her grandmother, and despite the fact with everyone, even though she knows what's going through, going through. They know that with Halloween comes up, everything goes a bit crazy for her. Uh, she nicely explains away what everyone thought that uh, Michael and Lori were brother and sisters, and she explains that away. We see that in the trailers, but I thought it was an interesting family dynamic about how Karen is trying to raise her daughter as opposed to what Karen had went through with uh, being raised by Lori. Uh, let's talk about the doctor. Dr. Uh, Saraton, I believe his name. He's supposed to be the uh, replacement for uh, Loomis. And uh, while I give, uh, what's his name, Hulk Bellinger credit for uh, tr trying to do, a, trying to play a different role, the doctor, he's no Donald Pleasance, but I didn't expect anyone, I didn't expect uh, anyone to try to fill that role. Uh, he does what he can playing this doctor that's taken over Dr. Loomis and he, he's okay. Uh, there are some parts I'll talk about later about his character but as far as story-wise is concerned he's he's just a fill-in and that's all he is because you're not going to replace the late great Donald Pleasance. One of the things I'm really glad that they didn't do in this particular movie is fill this movie with uh, typical slasher tropes. I mean, yeah, we get teenagers in this film, and they do the typical teenager things, but they're just typical teenagers. They're not the typical stereotypical tropes. Yeah, we got this guy, uh, I think is her, I think Vicky's boyfriend, he, he, you know, he seems like all he does is smoke dope, but that's what teenagers do, but they're not the typical tropes. You know, we don't have the don't have the virgin type. We don't have the slutty type. They're just teenagers being teenagers, and they're going to a dance. I mean, what film you're not going to have a slasher film, and them not going to a dance? But I'm glad we didn't get the typical teenage tropes in this film. <laughs> now, one of the things I kind of didn't like in the film uh, during the bus escape, when Michael when the bus crashes. Now we don't see the crash. A father and son drive up and they see the bus crash. Now the father he gets out of the car immediately and takes his and asks people for help. Now I'm pretty sure that you would not leave your son alone in a bus crash with a bunch of strange people walking around the place. I think you would have gotten and dialed 911 <laughs> immediately and stayed with your child. But we have to have a story. Now of course when Michael does escape, he actually starts following the two reporters, and then he kills them with brutality in the uh, gas station. <laughs> like I said, kind of foreshadowing while they are standing at the gas station waiting to uh, drive back and do their reporting, uh, Michael Myers easily walks by them. <laughs> it was funny. And... While they're busy talking, he's killing one person, and he also kills the uh, both the gas attendants in very brutal fashion. I believe. I think this is uh, this particular my version of Michael. He's very brutal. I mean, he kills with, with without impunity. I mean, he just really kills the shit out of people in this entire film. Now, another, I, I guess they decided to add teenage angst in this picture, which I kind of didn't think really needed to be in there, but I guess it's just make us care uh, the Allison character a lot. They, when they go to the party and they're dressed up as Bonnie and Clyde, she's <laughs> she's Clyde and he's Bonnie, <laughs> which I thought was kind of fascinating. So, of course, we have the typical, oh, I'm going to um, kiss this other girl and she gets pissed off and she leaves him by. I guess they kind of added that so we can feel sorry for Allison's character. And to make matters worse, you know, her best friend or his best friend, he tries to get with her <laughs> because he feels as though he's, obviously, he's had a crush on her, but we could have saw that in earlier parts of the film that he actually did like her, but she went with him. But, you know, I, I guess that this... 
something to put in the film. But, of course, Michael kills this dude in very brutal fashion, too. I mean, he just literally stabbed the shit out of him. Now, we're going to come upon, since I've been talking about this, are the on-screen kills. And, boy, like I said before, Michael does his best. He's very brutal in this film. I mean, his on-screen kills are fascinating. Even when the kills that we see, I mean, the guy in the gas station, he really just bunges the one guy to death and there's blood all over the place. The cashier looks like he split it, really ripped his jaw open. Uh, when he kills the um, the two reporters in the scene, just brutal fashion, beats the guy up to death and just literally strangles the female, female up and then cracks her neck open. I mean, they don't pull their punches neither. He even kills a kid. In the car after he kills his I mean you see on the road you see his father his neck is snapped in a very grotesque way uh, the kid in the car he gets in the car and he kills him it's like he snapped his neck they don't pull their punches in this film when Michael kills he kills let's see we have other kills in the film uh, we saw in the trailers <laughs> but a much more extended play in the movie uh, he takes a woman's hammer and beats her to death with a hammer and gets his knife he stabs one woman uh, in the what you would call him in the throat after she uh, he strangles her really just stabs her right in the neck not the slit throat time that we mostly see in slasher he just really just says fuck it bam and slaps her right in the throat very on screen kill uh, like you said he kills Allison friend he just literally just stabs her right in the back and, uh, and that was a fantastic kill the uh, only part I really didn't like and we're going to get back with the doctor now with the doctor uh, he seems to be okay uh, he gets on the bus with Michael because he feels as though he's my patient until you get transferred over. Uh, then he kills the sheriff. And I guess they wrote this part because I felt as though they, because uh, when it comes to psychiatry and dealing with uh, patients with Michael Myers, they get so obsessed with it that they actually start to want to become more experienced what they're experiencing. So I guess this doctor felt it's still the only way he can experience Michael's uh, uh, kill method was to kill himself. <laughs> because when he kills the sheriff uh, with this uh, knife he had hidden in his pen, and he says, is this is how this feels, Michael? And he's rubbing his mask all sexually and rubbing. He actually puts the mask on uh, when he get, drags Michael's back into the police car with Allison in the car. And it seems like he felt as though this was the ultimate experience by having Michael uh, confront uh, Lori. It wouldn't even surprise me because we don't see it, but it's led to believe that he might have caused the bus accident. He probably was the one that helped Michael escape because he wanted to see Michael out in the open. And <laughs> perhaps one of the best kills in the movie, and I think the franchise, when, the, the, when Michael uh, ba beats him up in the car after he wakes up, and uh, he literally bashes the guy out in the car. Michael stands over him and the guy says, Speak, Michael, speak. And Michael just literally stops his entire bread in with his foot. <laughs> I can't help it. That scene was funny. <laughs> oh, but you can't get a better kill than that. So, like I was saying before, it, it, I guess the reason why they put that in there, uh, like I said, you know, some kind just like they said, they get obsessed. They want to experience or they be start to become the person that they're trying to uh, reach or trying to uh, uh, um, communicate with. And, uh, and I thought there was kind of a shoehorn plot. It really didn't need to be in there. But I guess it felt we, we had to have something in there. But I really don't think it was needed. But hey, what you going to do? I mean, I, I think this would be better just let the doctor be a victim and just move on. And now we get to the final confrontation between Laurie and Michael. And it was pretty good. I like the setup, uh, how everything is. Uh, we see a scene in the picture where uh, Michael breaks into the house. And it looks like he's about to kill Laurie, but Laurie shoots him with the shotgun. She is fully prepared for battle uh, throughout the final confrontation. I like it. It was nicely well paced. It was well done. Uh, we get some nice surprises. Uh, how the daughter finally comes to uh, accept what her mother has been doing. Uh, the daughter, she, uh, her daughter comes in, Allison comes in, and the mother protects him. I had no problem with that setup. I like how she, um, Lori, sets up everything, sweeping the house and locking the doors. It was all basically a huge, nice design set trap for Michael. 
Now, I also like the fact that they actually played vintage to the original because we have a role reversal here. When Michael throws Lori out of the house and she falls into the ground, he's looking because we can hear Allison scream out her name. And then when he looks back, Lori's gone. <laughs> She's not even there. It was nicely set up. And uh, uh, I know some people were complaining about when Michael's entered the house and then he finds a trap door and rips it open because they felt it's still how can Michael do that. I really didn't have a problem with it. Um, obviously, Mike was not stupid. Uh, obviously, he has some sense of purpose, uh, whether it, you know, and nothing's not going to stand in his way. So when he realized that that was not a real dresser, he just simply moved it out of the way. But then again, as we come to find out, the whole thing was designed to be a trap. And I like how they trapped Michael. <laughs> uh, uh, Judy, uh, Karen pretends that she's some weak woman and she says they can't do it and can't do it. And Michael appears. And she says, fooled you. Boom! And takes a nice shot, too. <laughs> I mean, she really does shoot him. Uh, not in the brain, but shoots him well enough to incapacitate him. Because that's basically what they want to do. He falls down the steps. Next thing you know, they um, they all run up. Uh, Allison, gets, she gets her stuff in it when she stabs Michael. And the one thing I did like about this, they didn't make Michael superhuman. Uh, like he has in the previous film. He's just He is still an ordinary man who is just determined to kill people. But he's still human. They didn't make him superhuman like they have in the other films. It's like he gets shot, he's still walking. I mean, come on now. <laughs> Let's not get carried away. Uh, but he's still uh, a menacing type. He's still menacing in the film, even though he's not superhuman. Uh, but they trap him. I like how uh, they set everything up for the gas. And they just burn him alive. And uh, I had no problem how the film in it. We see all the stroke women. They are survivals. I even like the little uh, hint at the end of the film where Allison still has the knife in her hand. You see her has it like gripping in the hand. Now, obviously, uh, there's going to be a lot of theories. A lot of people are going to say, oh, this is going to be a sequel. Uh, she's going to be cursed. You know, some stuff like that. Some way back to what happened to um, Jamie, I think it was uh, Daniel Harrison's character in four or, five, 4 or 5. Yeah, 4 and 5. She wasn't in 6. So, uh, that's basically it. I uh, really didn't have no problem with the film. Like I said, the only problems I had with the film was the uh, the boyfriend part and the doctor part. Those are the only two flaws I actually had with the film. But I enjoyed it immensely as I rated it in my uh, non-spoiler review. I uh, did gave it, I gave it, I gave it four, I gave it four out of my five gold coins. I truly enjoyed the film. Uh, I think the film is destined to make over 80 million uh, I think domestically. I don't know how it's going to do worldwide, but I will say this, and I will say this with, I'll uh, say this wholeheartedly, because the, if the movie is success, and it's going to be a success, expect reboots of Jason and Freddy to be greenlit quickly. <laughs> Trust me, uh, depending upon who has the rights to uh, Friday the 13th and the uh, Jason films because they're because uh, if I understand correctly the reason why they couldn't use Friday the 13th um, after 9 because I think Paramount actually owns the Friday the 13th uh, copyright title that's why they couldn't call Jason that's why they couldn't call Jason X Friday the 13th to call it Jason X so whoever owns the rights that's what they're going to try to do I don't know if they're going to do a full reboot or just take it back from the 2009 reboot. Uh, Freddy will probably definitely get a full reboot uh, because no one liked the, uh, the the Freddy that came out uh, several years ago. Now definitely, good, but definitely those two would get green boots. I've also read that uh, Danny McBride would like to do a soft reboot of uh, Phantasm because. Uh, this movie six is going to be a success, and uh, he's going to be a uh, hot to write another horror project. And here we go. We have another comedian, such as Danny, uh, just like Gordon Peele with uh, Get Out and John Kaczynski with uh, Quiet Place. Uh, we're might going to have a new trend where they're going to give uh, comedy people who have been in comedy all their lives to write horror films. <laughs> so that's it. That is my spoiler review of... Halloween 2018. Like I said, I really enjoyed the film. Uh, it gives a, it definitely pays very homage to the original film. It definitely makes up for all the crap that we saw from uh, some of the Halloweens, especially 
resurrection and um, uh, some of the th part of the Thorn trilogy. Because, like I said, out of the Halloween films that I like, I like one. I kind of like two. Uh, three was okay. I liked uh, H2O. Didn't like four. Definitely didn't like six. And I definitely hated uh, hated uh, Resurrection. <laughs> so this film definitely makes this up. As I stated in my non-spoiler review, if I were to rank these films, uh, this would be my second favorite Halloween film in the franchise. But what about you, my horror fans? Uh, how would you rank the Halloween series after watching this film? And what do you think about some of the stuff that I talked about today and some of the stuff that you've probably seen in the movie. Uh, leave your comments down in your comment section below and tell me what you thought, uh, how you ranked the Halloween franchise after watching this film. Well, that's my video for today, guys. Hope you did enjoy it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up because it does help the channel out a lot. And once again, if this is your first time here, please hit that subscribe button and ring that notification bell. That way you can come and enjoy the horror experience with me, the horror miser, Mani G. And as always, all my social media links will be down in the description box below as well. Once again, my name is Lamont Smith, better known as the horror miser, Mani G. And always remember, horror rules. <laughs> See y'all guys later. I'm out.